and uh, you know, thanks the organizers for moving the talk to 10 o'clock from 9 o'clock. I mean, shows a healthy respect for age. <laughs> I think I'm going to take advantage of that, and uh, uh, my talk will not contain uh, anything explicit about random matrices or about dynamics, so I hope it has some relevance to both of them. What I'm going to talk about is really about giving some incomplete information, not necessarily correct or what. Uh, when can you extend it and how can you extend it to more uh, global information? I guess in some sense when you use random matrices to describe a physical system, you are giving some uh, partial information also about it, so maybe some relevance over there. Anyway, this work has been going on for many years on and off, mostly off. <laughs> but, uh, so I want to review some of the uh, things from a long time and uh, mention some collaborators. Uh, I'll start out um, with sort of classic or semi-classic truncated moment problem. Uh, I guess still jets, uh, uh, toplets, hamburger, and what considered that. Then uh, I'll talk about a truncated moment problem, infinite dimension, uh, which really means you're given some correlation functions for uh, maybe an infinite system or a finite system you want to reconstruct or to see whether there exists some kind of a process, point process, which corresponds to such correlations. And then I'll talk really about extension of measures, uh, classical, and then uh, just very little, some recent, or not so, well, last year or so, work for about density matrices uh, with a different cast of collaborators over there. So let me start with a truncated mon moment problem. Uh, just when you have one random variable, you ask the following question. Give them a set of real numbers. Uh, you could also be in the complex uh, plane, but I'll talk about the real one m1, m2, mn, does there exist a probability measure on some set k uh, which could be contained in the real line or it could be the whole real line such that m0 equals 1 and that's the first n moments are given by these uh, real numbers. I mean, this is a, uh, well, some setting, it's a very natural question you're given. I mean, uh, it's, not, it's a different question from the problem when you're given all the moments and you're asking does there exist uh, a measure on it. This is specifically you're given only uh, some of the moments. Uh, in, uh, to. Now, I'll, just examples of necessary and sufficient condition for hold, let's say, just give m1, m2, m3. I will always take m0 as being 1. That's just a normalization of the measure. Then k uh, is just the real or the positive real line. And, uh, well, obvious uh, thing is, does this, does this have a pointer? Yeah. Uh, M1 obviously has to be greater or equal to zero if you are on R plus. This is, uh, of course, very familiar. And this one is also easy to show that you need to have, uh, when K is R plus, that m3 over m1 has to be bigger than m2 over m1 squared. The question we have been mostly interested in, which has much less literature on it, and less is known, is when k is just a set of the natural numbers. I mean, this could correspond to, uh, like, uh, particles uh, in a box or particles in a given region of space, but where the uh, variable are just integers, I mean, over there. Now, uh, it's again easy to show, uh, obviously this has to be true, but no, instead of m2 just minus m1 squared being greater or equal to zero, you have now that m2 minus m1 squared has to be greater than this number theta 1, 1 minus theta 1, where theta 1 is a fractional part of m1. So if m1 is equal to some integer uh, k plus theta 1, then if you uh, then you cannot have um, if theta one is not zero, 
you cannot have m2 minus m1 squared equals zero. It has to be greater than this number. Uh, the same thing if you have m3 over m1 has to be greater uh, minus m2 over m1 squared. Instead of just being greater or equal than zero, it has to be equal to this fraction. So theta 1 and theta 2 uh, are the fractional parts of m1 and m2 over m1 respectively. Uh, case 1, which is just uh, semi-infinite, the positive real line, is part of the, uh, sort of, has been studied a lot, as particularly by still jets, and there are known conditions for realizability or consistency. You said something about fractional part of M1. Yeah. You're looking for a solution on integers. Yes. Does M1 have to be an integer? No. You can have a probability of being equal to 1 or equal to 2. The average will oh, be 3 halves. Of course, I'm being stupid. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah, no, you don't have to be an integer. Right. Uh, so, uh, uh, anyway, uh, so you, uh, I say for the case of the continuum case, there are known conditions uh, in terms of uh, positivity of Henkel matrices. The case two, which I mentioned already, corresponds to statistics of number of particles in a given room, is less well studied and much more complicated. We have no explicit formula for necessary and physical conditions when n is greater than 4. Uh, for n equals 2, this condition is actually something uh, known as the classical <laughs> fluids literature, uh, per, uh, sorry, Yamada condition. Uh, under the, uh, and just to give you a flavor, I'm not going to give you any proofs uh, in general in this talk. I mean, you want to look at the variance m2 minus m1 squared, how small it can be. So you take m1 is equal to an integer plus a fractional part, say to 1. Uh, it's easy to see that if you want to make the variance as small as possible, uh, the measure has to be concentrated on k and k plus 1, and then if you simply write it out, you get this condition. Uh, you can do more or less the same for uh, n equals 3, but uh, unfortunately, not for n equals 4. At least we don't know any necessary and sufficient condition. I mean, we know some necessary conditions, and we know uh, some sufficiency conditions, but they do not correspond to. So this is just an introduction. It's a simple case. It's the type of problem we want to do. We are given some information, and we want to know, does there exist some more global information for which this is consistent with? Uh, yeah, so we can also ask the question in multidimensional case, and since uh, and we actually know very little about it, so... Uh, what we really uh, are interested in, what we started uh, this pr program for, was for the case where we look at, uh, given an infinite number of information, will come in a moment. So this is so the problem we, uh, I will be discussing for some time now, is uh, you have specified low order correlations. Um, so, uh, and you want to know, does there exist uh, does there exist a random uh, a field uh, which corresponds to these low order correlations? So, the, so we are looking for um, so we are looking for some kind uh, of a random field uh, where the points are distributed according to some measure defined in a family, let's say, a locally finite collections of points. In, Delta can be either the Dirac delta function if we are in the continuum, or it can be uh, just uh, Kronecker delta zero or one if we are on a lattice and we do not want to have more than one particle per lattice site. So you can, so we, so, so what? In the xi can represent positions of particle in a fluid, or stars in the sky. I think uh, some of the people who were interested, particularly this is occurrence times of a number of train of neural spikes. So you have a certain statistics on it. And you want to know, again, can you extend it to some kind of uh, infinite uh, think, a point process on it? Uh, yeah, and of course, it can also be uh, involve uh, 
positions and velocities of particles I mean, uh, in the space, not just the positional part. In, uh, it's an, actually in that context, I think, it may be relevant for non-equilibrium uh, situations where you want to know something about the measures. So the correlation functions are just uh, are defined just averages. So that uh, rho of R1 is just expectation value of this 8, etc. In general, rho k uh, is the uh, uh, expectation value of the product of Rj minus Xij. Uh, in the lattice, of course, this rho k, since I'm uh, insisting that this is for distinct um, uh, particles, and since you cannot have two particles, and it will vanish when R I equals R J. That's so level. And uh, I'll be interested a lot in translation invariant processes where rho 1, R1 is rho, rho 2, R1, 2 is usually called the radial distribution, or at least uh, pair correlation. You factor those, the rho square, etc. Uh, this is known in the fluid literature where it is additionally assumed that G is a function only of the distance. That's isotropic fluids uh, and it's a radial distribution function. And in general, I will, if I'm given some rho k, I will in general assume uh, that it goes to a product uh, no correlations when the distances uh, go to infinity. So we are so the question of, we study the following infinite dimensional truncated moment problem. Suppose we are given functions f1, r1, f2, r1, r2. Does there exist an underlying point process with these correlations? If so, what can we say about it? When you are given, by the way, uh, all the moments and you are asked, uh, I mean, n going to infinity, this is a problem considered in equilibrium statistical mechanics a long time ago by Andrew Lennart and other people who give conditions on it. But here we're really, I mean, you cannot get the truncated moment problem from the infinite one. You can go sort of in some way to the other way, but not uh, just given information about infinite moments. It doesn't tell you much about the truncated moment problem. So uh, these correlations, can come from an averaging and smoothing of observations, like in the neural spike trains or from some approximate theory, such as the Perkiewicz equation for the radial distribution function of a classical fluid. I mean, uh, in the class in theory of classical fluids for equilibrium systems, there are many kinds of so-called approximate integral equations. Since we do not know the exact, uh, we cannot evaluate from the a Gibbs measure, what the correlations actually are, there are people have developed uh, various kinds of approximate things which are uh, pretty good in some domains. Uh, but then it's a natural question, this is what got it interested in it, does there exist any point process corresponding to this particular uh, approximation? Never mind whether it corresponds to the particular equilibrium system. Like you have a system of hard spheres and you're given a certain approximation for the radial distribution function at a given density. So-called Perkiewicz approximation is a well-known among people who do classical fluids. Does it correspond to any uh, uh, point process? Or is it simply, like in the moment problem, it doesn't satisfy certain conditions, then there is no point process lying behind it. Uh, yeah, so mention here, I think people mention a different context also. Supposing you are given this fj up to a certain n, and uh, you find that they can be realized, uh, I'm talking about translation invariant case, similar in general, for some density rho, then they can also be realized for the same function g2, gk, for any rho prime which is less than rho. Namely, uh, if you have a point process which gives you these correlations, let's see, certain density rho, you can do a simple uh, thinning argument. You can, at uh, any point, you can leave in with a probability um, uh, rho prime over rho and uh, delete it with a probability 1 minus rho prime over rho for rho prime less than rho. And then you get a, a, a new system 
with density rho prime, but with the same uh, radial distribution function and higher order kind of correlations. So the kind of thing we ask actually usually, uh, given the GJ, I mean, let me remind you again, the GJ are here, uh, you know, so uh, this, uh, this form, I'm talking for translation invariant uh, systems, what is the least upper bound row bar of the densities for which they can be realized? It's possible to have that you can have any density. If you take a Poisson process in the continuum, the GJ are equal to 1, uh, and then you can realize it for any density. On the lattice, of course, uh, you'll have a maximum density 1, because I, I do not permit more than one particle. So lacking a full answer to this question, we may ask rather for upper and lower bones on this maximum density row bar. Now we can obtain uh, a lower bound uh, by the construction of an explicit pr process at some density rho naught. Uh, and uh, while uh, upper bones may be obtained from necessary conditions for realizability, and some of which are described now. I mean, well, an obvious condition is, of course, this have to be non-negative. And we also know that this covariance matrix uh, has to be positive semi-definite, which applies in particular uh, if you take the Fourier transform of this SR1, R2, then it has to be non-negative. I mean, that's a standard, obvious, and necessary condition. If, if you are given uh, some row 2 and row 1, uh, that this has to be positive, uh, which corresponds to a translation invariant case that if you take this uh, Fourier transform, it has to be non-negative. Uh, there are corresponding conditions. So these are necessary conditions, which are standard necessary conditions. They are obviously uh, uh, not sufficient. I mean, you also have other necessary conditions like that before, that the variance of the number of particles in a given region, lambda, uh, has to be greater than this, I guess, what I called before, theta 1, 1 minus theta 1, which is a fractional part. So you have uh, some necessary conditions over there. Now, more generally, you can show uh, uh, these necessary conditions are special cases when you take, uh, let's say, if you're just looking um, f1 and f2, take any function f2, uh, which has to be plus f1 plus f0, which has to be non-negative, then when you take the average, obviously it also has to be non-negative. But there's an infinite number of these. I mean, is there any uh, such functions? And one of the things. Uh, proves that this is also a sufficient condition for realizability under some additional assumption uh, like that the maximum number of particles in a given region cannot be uh, infinite. It has to be bounded above. Yeah, this has been sort of extended uh, instead of needing a hard core, so which uh, limits the total number of particles in a region. You can do uh, some weaker condition. Uh, I guess this is the most mathematical part of our thing. And if you don't have a hard core, you need some additional condition. Uh, OK, then you, uh, yeah, I should just notice for the case k equals 2, all these restrictions are, uh, on the non-negativity of rho are due to the fact that we want a to r to be a point process. I mean, uh, we can always find uh, a Gaussian process realizing uh, row 1 and row 2, just for as long as S covariance uh, is, is greater than uh, 0. Oh, yeah, for uh, there is also uh, an interesting sort of subset which we're interested in. What happens when the variance does not grow like the volume? If the expected number of particles goes like the volume, but suppose the variance is 0. This is, for example, the case, just let me mention random matrices. If you have uh, uh, the bulk eigenvalue distribution of a random uh, standard Dyson random matrices, let's say on an interval, 
then the variance grows only like the logarithm, n not like the volume uh, together. And then uh, if you do for the, I guess, Geneva matrix, uh, eigenvalues in two dimension again as a bulk, you have that the variance grows like the perimeter over there. But there is a very nice theorem um, by uh, my colleague Joseph Beck. Uh, supposing you have any point process, but you, uh, it's spherical, or you, uh, you make it sphericalize it. How small can the variance be? And he shows that the variance uh, cannot be smaller than proportional to the perimeter once you sphericalize it. If you don't do it sphericalized, like if you look on a lattice and you have a rectangular domain, so what? You can have a, a variance which grows slower than the parameter, but not, I mean, the randoms being you look at the different sized boxes or something like that, or where you start. It's an interesting result. Uh, you know, to prove the realizability, uh, you can show um, you need the, uh, you have to uh, show that there exists such a process. In a very nice work by two uh, Armenian mathematicians, Ambert Sumian and Suki Asen, they claim, uh, they prove the following thing. Uh, that uh, if, um, uh, I'll give you the condition in a moment. For given some pair correlation function, uh, then for uh, you know, density rho, then you can construct a point process via the following ansatz. Namely, uh, you just take that the higher order uh, correlation functions are given by just the density to the n times the product of this gr minus rj. Uh, so it, as long as one can show that this actually corresponds to a point process consistent, you have a realization of it. Now, it's a very interesting paper. I didn't believe it first because, uh, I don't know, if you are, some of you are familiar uh, with the beginning of statistical mechanics about convergence of the fugacity expansion. We'll recognize, well, this is actually, uh, that the end result, which is, I mean, um, is that the, uh, this can be done when the density is less uh, than uh, e to the phi plus 1 b, where b is, uh, uh, is like this uh, absolute value of the second uh, virial coefficient, and phi is a, a stability condition, that uh, if, you, if, if log of g was a potential, then this would be, uh, uh, you have to have a lower bound, which is proportional to n. Uh, but the way these people do it, never any reference to, uh, to this work about uh, H-stability, what goes the name for Ruel or what, they do it just from scratch. Uh, I mean, they consider it only the case when, uh, when G uh, is less than 1, so uh, minus log of G is positive, so this is... Uh, obviously satisfied. Yeah. No, it's interesting that uh, uh, so what you have to show is that when uh, that these densities or correlation functions really uh, do specify a point process. And so you, uh, essentially when you do it, oh, what you have is that uh, what corresponds uh, to the fugacity uh, Sort of corresponds in a way to uh, minus the density over here, and, the, and you can show that you have uh, a point process because you have a, uh, all the no, because you have a point process. Everything is uh, is okay. Uh, yeah, the result also holds for the thing, and when they are not translation invariant, then. The existence of such extension shows there exists a realizable measure for a set of correlations, then it will be, there will be an infinite, uncountable number of measures which can realize it. I mean, it's, it's not uh, just one or, I mean, this could, uh, measure. Oh, the next question we asked, can a specified set of correlation functions can be realized by, by at least one point process 
can it also be realized by a Gibbs measure involving at most k particle potentials. You're given, uh, remember, you're given uh, rho 1 to rho k over there. And the answer is yes, at least we can show it uh, easily for the case uh, when you have just a subset of the lattice where the number of particles again is restricted. Uh, in, you can have a Gibbs measure also. And, uh, we call, yeah, and the only the way we do it is simply showing that if you maximize the entropy, standard Gibbs Shannon entropy, subject to specified constraints, then under appropriate conditions, that row one x is, uh, is realizable strictly less than the maximum, uh, then we can use Lagrange multipliers here in the interior of the domain. And presumably, this is true. Uh, more generally, too, so we haven't quite worked out all the number of uh, the requirements. Yeah, I mean, instead of the usual uh, thing where you prove that maximizing the entropy gives you a Gibbs measure under some constraints, here you're given an infinite number of constraints rather than a finite number of constraints. Uh, oh, here is a simple example. Maybe, uh, yeah, supposing. Uh, uh, you want to have that uh, g of r is 0 if r is less than 1. means you cannot have center of two particles closer than 1. But you also want to have um, uh, that uh, g of r equals 1 exactly if r is greater than 1. And the question is, for what densities can you realize this kind of a pair correlation? And uh, you can get upper and lower bounds. Uh, uh, for that, uh, for the density rho bar in dimension d. So if you are in a density less than that, uh, and you are in this range, you can uh, you can realize it. In one dimension, you can uh, easily show. You can give an example which goes a little bit better. For example, let me do the case of z. Supposing you want to have. Uh, that you cannot have two neighboring sites occupied by particles. So, but you say, if you are not neighboring sites, then there is no, cor no pair correlation between them. And then you can uh, easily do a construction. You start out with a Bernoulli process of density rho, where, uh, uh, so each site is occupied independently with probability rho. Then you look at what you get. And whenever, so you look at any particle, whenever there is an, uh, another particle at the neighboring side to the right, you remove this particle. So you end up with something that you have no nearest neighbors, but there is no correlation, no pair correlation induced between the further particles. Now, how big a density do you end up then? Uh, you end up with a density, uh, the maximum. You have to have a particle at a given site and no particle on the neighboring site. So it's rho times 1 minus rho, you get 1 quarter. And you do it on the continuum in one dimension, this gives you 1 over e. That's the maximum of rho e to the minus rho uh, uh, of that quantity. But uh, the upper bound and lower bound, at uh, least uh, the best we could do, are still far apart. And we do not know if you have a density in between, whether you can or cannot realize uh, a, a such, uh, a, such a thing. So this is our OK. So that was realizability. And now I come to, really, to a somewhat different problem, but still in the very same spirit. And this is something. Uh, so here, instead of giving moments or correlation functions, uh, over, uh, let's say, for all values of the thing, I, I do something different. Uh, I imagine I can measure the whole probability distribution in a given subset of ZD. Uh, and uh, of course, if I, I really have a probability distribution, if I do not require anything else, I can do something else, any other set over there. But what I want to require, can I extend it to uh, translation invariant measure. I mean, if I'm given just, let's say, uh, if I'm on the lattice in one dimension, and I'm given the exact distribution function on sites 0, 1, and 2. 
So I know I have a distribution of that. And of course, I can take, uh, doesn't tell me anything about size 4, 5, and 6 a priori. So what I want to do is I want to find a translation invariant measure whose projection on the sides 0, 1, and 2 is the measure that I am given as that. So this is the extension uh, of measures problem. Uh, well, an obvious condition is that the marginal of mu lambda, supposing you take some subset of lambda, and then you translate it, and you are still in the region lambda, you must have the same weight. So if you're, uh, if you're given on 0, 1, and 2, you have so you have the marginal, let's say, on 0, 1, but then this must be equal to the same marginal on 1 and 2 uh, over there. In fact, uh, this, this is uh, sufficient. Oh, here is sort of a side remark, is that uh, on the lattice, uh, if you are given uh, a measure, sigma lambda, it can always, uh, where sigma is plus or minus 1, which is the spin language, then you can write the actual measure in terms of expectation values of the sigma a. So this you can a way of parameterizing that measure in terms of the expectation values. It's, uh, this is very easy to see, and it's sometimes uh, it's sometimes convenient uh, over there to to do that. Uh, but of course, uh, if you simply uh, and again. To be in uh, pre-translation invariant means that the expectation value of sigma b is the same as the expectation value of sigma b when b is the translate of a. They're both contained over there. Of course, in using the both uh, form, given sigma a, one must check that it assigns a non-negative probability to each configuration. I mean, just given some numbers sigma a, uh, this does not necessarily assign non-negative probabilities uh, over there. So that's, you have to check that. I mean, that's, again, the realizability condition. So the question is now the other way around. Supposing that mu lambda is indeed pre-translation invariant, then the possibility of extension depends on the dimension. I mean, we show by an explicit construction for the one-dimensional lattice, and in fact also for the real line, that all pre-translation invariant measures are extendable. In higher dimensions, on the contrary, it is possible to construct pre-translation invariant measures on the unit square in Z2, which are not extendable. I mean, uh, we do not have any uh, good criterion for knowing when uh, in two dimensions, a pre-translation invariant measure on some rectangle can be extended to a translation invariant measure in both directions. And while in one direction, we have no problem at all. Unit square, you mean the one with four points? Yes. Yeah. That's, and I'll give you an example uh, where we can give a pre-translation invariant measure on the four points, which is not extendable. But you cannot do it in one dimension. At least if you take uh, a block uh, over there uh, from 0 to k, any pre-translation invariant measure can be extended in one dimension to, uh, yeah, maybe it's not, it's not so surprising that you cannot extend it in two dimensions. But you want to know, uh, you'd like to have some criteria when you can or when you cannot uh, extend it. Uh, you see it has to do basically with the Markov structure, the one-dimensional case, which doesn't. So uh, just to check, pre-translation invariance means that if you have a, a measure uh, on um, k plus one side starting from, um, let me go back just a moment. Yeah, so we consider uh, lambda being the set I guess should get something brighter. <laughs> lambda is this. Hmm. Yeah, z uh, is just 0 0.01k, and mu lambda is just a measure on these points, where this can be 0, 1. Um, so when you say a measure on z, you really mean a measure on subsets. 
Yeah, and it's the usual uh, Kolmogorov reconstruction. If you have a measure on all subsets which are no, consistent, then. Yeah, yeah. That's just statistical mechanics. You do an infinite uh, system. Yeah, of course. Of course. I measure some x k, which is zero, one to the k plus one. Of course, this is the measure is, uh, but it's easier to to, to yeah. have to say the word configurations. Yes, you're absolutely right. <laughs> and so is Barry right? Well, anyway, so uh, so we look at the so we are given a measure on this k plus one points, and now uh, actually turning out. To, in order to have pre-translation invariance, it's sufficient simply uh, if you take the marginal by summing over the first sites, or you take the marginal by summing over the last sites, getting you no know, a measure on k points that these are the same. Uh, uh, is, uh, that's uh, obviously necessary and also sufficient. And then, uh, so we, the way we extend the measure is in a very obvious way in one dimension. So we want to. So we're given the measure on uh, a to zero uh, as a configuration just of zero to k. We want to extend it to k plus one. We simply take the product of the measures from a to zero to a to k, or from a to one to a to k plus one, and divide it by the reducing. Of course, if this is zero, then we just set it equal to zero. You cannot have it over there. So. Uh, and then it's easy to check uh, that you get uh, the correct marginals. Because if you, integrate it, uh, if you integrate over this, it cancels this, and you get just this part. If you integrate over a to 0, again, it cancels with this part, and you get just uh, Yeah, so it, it's easy to see that this can be extended then to any subset uh, over there to get a pre-translation invariant measure. Another way of writing is you say that the conditional probability of having a 1 or a 0 at k plus 1, given everything before, depends only uh, on k. So you have a Markov process with simply a k-step. Uh, you have a k-step Markov process. And uh, so you can get it in this way. So the extension process defines a Markov process having finite memory. Some probabilities depend only as a previous game step. The translation invariant extension of mu k is just the invariant measure on sample paths for this chain. Now, it turns out that this is actually the maximal entropy extension. Uh, this extension is a way that you get, if you ask, uh, give them a measure on a subset lambda, you want to go to a bigger set, and you want to know how to, how to extend it in a maximal entropy way, this is a way uh, that you would ex uh, you would extend it, uh, just uh, you take the, uh, because if you look at the entropy for the k plus one, it's given just in the terms of this, and you want to get the maximal value of s, uh, is a measure which gives you the maximal value of s under the constraint that when you do it, you marginal on the smaller set, it corresponds to what you are given already. So you just want to do that, and it's just a general problem in uh, if you're given uh, on some sets A or configurations on A, configurations on B and C, that uh, the measure on the union of A, B, C uh, has to satisfy this uh, subadditivity properties of the entropy. And uh, it is achieved. Uh, by taking for mu of a, b, c, just the measure of a, b, the measure of b, c, divided by the measure of b. Of course, these measures on a, b, and on a, c, uh, have to be <coughs> such that they agree on b. Then you, uh, you know, so you have a, a measure, and this is what we are doing now. Just saying, uh, imagine you have some conf uh, configurations in a given set a, another set configurations. So, uh, conf a union B, and you have B union C, you give measures on those which agree on their intersection, then you want to extend it to a measure, and you can always do it. Uh, and this is, 
I'll come, well, I guess I'll still have some time. I come to the quantum mechanics. That's just uh, what you cannot do quantum mechanically in general because of uh, interference effects. Yeah, so translation invariant will be Gibbs with interaction potential which involve at most k plus one side. They will have a range at most k. Of course, these can be peculiar interactions. I mean, uh, you could say that you cannot permit uh, having two zeros next to each other. Or uh, you cannot permit having zero, one, zero. But it will still be a kind of a Gibbs measure with this kind of a finite range potential that you can extend it to. Uh, yeah. Yeah, an interesting thing is that if you do this extension, you find the measure for when you're uh, looking at, uh, sorry, you find the entropy for the measure on k plus j uh, sites. It's just the measure on k, uh, the entropy of what you get for the uh, k is actually, I mean, you have k plus 1 sites and you have s of k minus s of k minus 1 so that you get the specific entropy per unit uh, per lattice site. It's just given by s of k minus s of k minus 1. And of course, if that is 0, uh, then it means, well, one can show then, it, that means that the entropy per unit site is going to go to 0. Uh, if one can show that this means, in fact, that the measure uh, lives on periodic configurations with a period L less than 2k. I mean, it's, it's, fair, it's, quite, hmm? it's quite simple, because if s of k is equal to s of k minus 1, meaning that the k, so if you're given the configuration on k minus 1 side, the configuration on the k side is already determined. And then you can uh, go on from that. But how many configurations can you have then? You cannot have more than 2k configurations, so you cannot have this. Um, uh, yeah, this can be, a, uh, instead of having it just on Z, you can have uh, a whole strip. And then at each site, you can consider not just 0, 1, but you can consider the measure over there. Uh, everything goes through. In fact, so you can have, it doesn't have to be 0, 1, any finite configuration. You can go to countable configurations and even for the uh, continuum, you can also do the extension. But you cannot do whatever is doing two dimensions. Here is an example. I mean, suppose you take, yeah, there's a typo here. That this, this measure, not increase. This, so, uh, so I take just four sites, and I give weight one quarter to these four configurations. And I give zero weight to all the other 12 configurations. Now, you have to think a little bit, but you can see that you cannot extend this. Because if you want to extend it, you can always extend it in one direction. That's no problem. That's what we see in before. But if you extend it in that direction, so you have to, this has to get adjoined with this one. And then you, uh, when you end up with it, it's no longer pre-translation invariant in the vertical direction. If you do the extension in the, in, in the x direction. You can also extend it in the y direction, but then you don't, you lose or you can lose your pre-translation invariance uh, in the other direction. So there are definitely uh, measures cannot be. Uh, on the other hand, what is still true, I mean, uh, so you can say the following thing. Suppose you're given a translation invariant measure on, mu z, uh, on zd. Uh, then there exists a unique measure mu sub g, a Gibbs measure, on zd with translation invariant interaction of less than or equal to L, such the, proje the projection of the measure mu and the Gibbs measure mu g agree on any set which has a diameter less than L. Namely, if you're given translation invariant measure and then you project it on something, then of course it has an extension, by definition, because you started with it. But uh, once it has an extension, you can ask for the extension with maximal entropy, and that will be a Gibbs measure, which will then agree translation variance sync on, 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 uh, on these sets. And then, oh, we can also show that there, so the extension I've given is a maximal entropy extension. But you can also have extensions which are actually periodic uh, uh, 
extensions. I won't go through this because if not, I will not have any time for the uh, last part. Let me just say uh, there's an interesting way of how to represent this, something called the Bruin graphs, which can enter into various places. So if you've got uh, only two sites, so these are the configuration on the two sites, one, zero, and zero, one. If you have three sites, here are, you have gotten two to the three, eight arrows in all possible configurations. This is a directed graph. And you can, from this graph, you can see that you can go cycles will correspond to periodic measures. And there are some theorems about cycles on these De Bruyne graphs. Uh, I won't go into that. Yeah, oh, uh, yeah, one thing we also stu uh, studied there is uh, entropy minimizing measures. Instead of asking for entropy maximizing measures, you can also ask, can you extend it to a measure which will minimize the entropy? And the answer in one dimension, again, is yes. It's no longer unique. You can have more than one because the entropy you know, is a concave function. So the minimizers will be on the perimeter. And you can have many uh, of them. But what we can prove again that these entropy minimizing measures are always going to be periodic, superposition of periodic uh, measures, which obviously have finite entropy. Which means if you have kind of things like a Q-more uh, Q sequence or what, which is not periodic, uh, that this will not uh, have a finite uh, entropy. I mean, it might, entropy might grow only like the log or something, but it will not be finite. So let me come to the last topic. So, the, so we want to ask exactly the same question for quantum system we ask for classical system. Given a density matrix, suppose you have Hilbert space H1, H2, and H3. And you're given a density matrix on uh, 1, 2. You can think of this as uh, you know, two sites or two uh, blocks of sites. And you're given a measure on 2, 3, uh, the Hilbert spaces, which again are compatible. Namely, if you take the trace of over 1 of row 1, 2, it's the same as the trace over the third Hilbert space. And then the question you're asking, is there a density matrix? Row 1, 2, 3, such that when you take the trace of 1, you get 2, 3, and when you take the trace. And I said classically, this was always possible. If mu were measures, you can always, in one, two, where uh, say Hilbert spaces, you had just sets of configurations. This is always possible. But quantum mechanically, it turns out that this is not always possible. In fact, in general, it's not possible. I mean, an easy way to see um, example, I mean, supposing th these measures, rho 1, 2, uh, are pure measures with zero entropy, and so is rho 2, 3. But these themselves are not simply a product of row 1, row 2, and row 2, row 3. Now, if you were to have a density matrix on row 1, 2, 3, uh, which is not a product, then uh, you cannot satisfy the entropy subadditivity because if these are pure states, you would need to have, they will have zero for Neumann entropy, and you cannot do that. Yeah, I mean, you, you have to satisfy this one. You know, if S row 1, 2 is 0 and S row 2, 3 is 0, but S row 2 is not 0, then obviously uh, this cannot be satisfied over there. So in general, uh, you cannot do for the quantum system density matrix what you did classically. And we have really just very uh, poor control. We can give some examples where they can be extended, I mean, and obvious examples where they can uh, not be extended. But we really don't know much about it. So to conclude, what if any has a necessary and sufficient condition for extension of density? I mean, this is a problem which is really belongs to a very uh, big class of quantum information theory people uh, doing on that. Anyway, any solutions will get a bottle of good wine and a list of open problems. I'm exactly on time. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>